Hello, I'm Dave Mowitz and welcome to Successful Farming. On today's program, I'm heading to Illinois to watch the sale of a late model, low hour John Deere Gator. Then we feature an outdoor display of vintage John Deere horsepower from Iowa. We introduce a new segment to Successful Farming. Get ready for Shark Farmer TV. And after these brief messages, Successful Farming's Advanced Technology Editor, Lori Bedord, covers the AgBot Challenge, a competition for agricultural robots. So please stay tuned. When Kyler Laird envisions the future of his farm, he sees robotic machinery playing a large role. For me individually, it's necessary because I don't want to, and I, I really can't, hire people to do the work that I want the machines to do. Um, the idea of being able to find a really good planter operator who's willing to work 24 hours a day for three or four days out of the year and then go away. Um, that, that's just ludicrous. I can't get that, but I can, I can make that. So, and I can make it very inexpensively. And beyond that, I can use a much less expensive tractor. I can simplify a lot, and I can reduce my costs a lot by using the technology. I see people who say, oh, well, small farmers won't be able to afford that kind of automation, and I think, I'm a small farmer. I can't afford not to have that automation. I wanted to do a little tractor, um, and I had this little uh, John Deere 6330 that I had bought kind of on a whim. So I bought a, a planter on auction, salvage, and had a local shop, Solid Rock Farms, do a conversion with all precision planting gear. With, with Kyler's planter, um, our, our part in it was mostly the, um, the automated hardware on it. And there was a few things like the steering that he took care of, but mostly like the down pressure and the row cleaners um, and the, the, the meters. So we basically outfitted it with the latest um, meter planting technology and hydraulic downforce on every row. So we also have row cleaners on it that that automatically lift and lower when you, you, it is a manual adjustment in the cab, but it's much more automated than what it has been before. I have full confidence in what's going on um, planting our fields, and I really don't have to worry about it too much. I've got alerts that tell me exactly what's going on. I know that my down pressure is exactly how I need it. I know that my population is exactly correct. So we've got to the point where I can sit in the cab and I can think, Everything's under control, and I have full confidence that the system's going to work. So if, we, if we've got to that point, then I'm totally confident in taking the guy out of the cab. You know, we're kind of on the edge of, of that. We've got the auto steer. We've got the automated planting. The, you know, we can steer it through the field. The only thing we're really missing is the turnaround and the field setup. So we're kind of on the verge of, of being able to do that more efficiently. Um, but at the same time, that is a big leap. <laughs> Not only has Laird's autonomous machine been used to plant his crops this growing season, he entered his innovation in the AgBot Challenge. Laird, along with six other teams, competed to plant corn autonomously. We have a company in our uh, portfolio of group of companies we work with, and they, they provide rural broadband solutions for military, oil and gas, and um, marine industries, and we wanted to bring that technology to agriculture. So what we did was we set up our farm so that we have very high speed internet, capable up to gigabyte internet speed access. And when you're trying to create that vision for rural America, what we're looking for, we were looking for a symbo symbolic method to present what we could do in farming. So we came up with the AgBot Challenge, and the AgBot Challenge was essentially the challenge to the young folks in the universities and private companies to 
provide solutions to the farmer if they had that kind of broadband access. So this is basically a presentation to them of some of the things that could be accomplished in American agriculture if we allowed the innovation in other industries and robotics to come here and work with us in, in ag. Some believe the beefy machines in farm fields today will be downsized to smaller machines and will work in groups of five or more swarming a field. These smaller machines have the potential to solve several issues facing farmers and could be the catalyst for a major shift in agriculture. In, in agriculture today, and this is one of the things that I found most interesting about the competition when we started it last year, um, you know, you've, you, your, your, your setup for planning is a tractor planner combination. And the cost to get into agriculture today for that tractor planner combination is probably three, four, five hundred thousand dollars. We saw some teams take a traditional tractor planner combination and, and make it autonomous. So essentially make it self-driving. That's, that's probably the most straightforward approach to, to, to solving uh, the planning challenge. But there was a different section of, of uh, teams that completely rethought the problem. The, what they, the way uh, they came at the problem was, if there's no need for a person, there's no need for a seat. If there's no need for a seat, why do we need the tractor? And so when you take away the tractor, then you get it down to the planner. Now you have to figure out, okay, how can I make this planner move, right? And so what you, they ended up with is basically a combination, a purpose-built, self-propelled autonomous planner. It changes the entire uh, economic logistics of planning because a self-contained autonomous planner could be produced much, much cheaper uh, than what a combination tractor planner can be done. Um, the price point for one of these, they figure, might be around $50,000. So $50,000 versus $500,000. While the, the concept is, is kind of radical in terms of how we've approached this, this problem in the past, the, uh, the opportunity is totally new. Uh, you know, those of us that think about planning would never have thought about creating a self-propelled autonomous planner, uh, and that's the kind of thing that some of these teams come up with. While the AgBot Challenge is working to move this technology forward, there are still obstacles to overcome. Back in 2016, we looked at the autonomous concept vehicle to show basically what that future could be. So our customers had indicated in the spring tillage they could see it fitting in to allow us to have multiple units in the field to have that spring prep of that ground completed. What they did tell us is that they actually wanted to sit in that tractor cab with the planter attached. And because they said, well, that's a high dollar crop they're putting in the ground as well as the inputs, they wanted to make sure that they were having visual eyes on that. And they followed it up with what type of sensors could you actually see on the planter being implemented. And those are the areas that we're exploring further. One thing that I think it needs to be, be developed to really enable autonomous systems are perception systems. And you need to be able to perceive things that you shouldn't drive over and pathways that you should drive down so that you can deploy a really safe system and that you can go through and you can detect uh, people uh, in the field, you can detect areas that you shouldn't drive such as big potholes, you can detect uh, pathways which you should drive down so that when you look at the system from the outside it's making a smart decision just as a human would. The guy that wants to sit in his tractor and drive it around, I mean, uh, we saw this with auto steer, right? Uh, auto steer had sort of the same issue, you know, like, why do I need something else to drive my tractor for me? I'm, I'm in it, right? Um, and, and similar sort of adoption, I think, with auto steer. Now guys, you know, a lot of guys that use it won't, won't live without it. Um, I, I think autonomous vehicles uh, can be about the same. We saw an example here today where, um, you know, a guy has a day job and he farms. It's just him. And so if he's running a combine, who's running his green cart? Uh, and, and he used the technology to basically be a one-man operation where he is in the tractor, but he's not in his, running his green cart, right? And his green cart could move between him and the guy operating his trucks uh, to get his grain off the field. So, you know, it's, it's a compliment. Um, you know, are we, are we going to replace farmers? No, because farmers love what they do, right? They love to be farmers. You know, these vehicles, uh, they have a place. I think, uh, I think it'll be just another tool in, uh, in the farmer's toolbox. We are pleased to introduce a new segment on successful farming. Rob Sharkey is an Illinois farmer and host of the Shark Farmer podcast on Farm and Rural Ag Network. Rob is going to be joining us from time to time to share his opinions on topics that are important to him. 
This week, he examines how farmers can and should use new media to connect with consumers. Do you ever see your local high school football coach on the news the night before the big game? They all sound pretty much the same. It's like, our defense needs to perform, our offense needs to execute, move the ball down the field. It's always the same. Do you ever wonder if the world sees farmers that way? Why well, farm so many acres? I grow this crop and that crop. I run this type of equipment. Now, just like the coach, it's because you only have so much time to tell your story. And honestly, it's the way it's always been done. Now, social media is changing that. Now we can tell more about the actual farmer and less about his farm. Sure, we see this guy as a great farmer, but yeah, we also see now that he's a giant tool. We also can say, hey, this guy is out in Iowa. He's growing cover crops. But he's also raising two kids with Down syndrome. And he's telling that story with social media. He's sharing pictures and videos of those kids and the joy he has involving them in his farming operation. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of my greatest memories growing up were sitting at the lunch table with my family as dad had the farm news going on and the radio in the background. We all listened to it so we could all be in the know. That's how dad kept up on farming in the markets. But I can pretty much get all that information just by a few clicks and a few seconds on the internet. Now I'm biased. I think the introduction into ag podcast and to this new ag media is, is a great thing. It allows farmers to tell their story in a different way. They can be more personable. They can be more open. Podcasts are different. You don't need any experience to get into them. You also don't have any preconceived ideas of how to do them. So you have people doing podcasts now that have never been involved in ag media. I think it has them asking different questions in different ways. Having farmers tell their stories in ways that have never been told. Tackling subjects and taboos that really we thought never should be talked about in agriculture before. And as a podcaster, it's been humbling to have people share their stories with me and be so open and honest. Even knowing that all of their virtual friends are going to see it. They're going to see actually who the person is. It has put a different spin on the way farmers are perceived, not just within agriculture, but within the entire world. Now, is this new ag media going to take over the old ag media? Well, no, of course not. But I think as both evolve, they're going to learn to complement each other more and more. I'm Rob Sharkey, host of the Shark Farmer podcast. You can find that podcast on sharkfarmer.com. You can find more information like this on agriculture.com slash TV. Hey, what would you bid for a 2011 Deer Gator 625i that only has 190 hours on its tack? Wow, a seven-year-old UTV that is in like new condition. You have to stay tuned to see what it sells for after these brief messages. All-terrain utility vehicles like this John Deere 625i have become as common on farms and ranches as pickup trucks, and for good reason, as they're useful for not only hauling people, but a cargo bed of work anywhere around a farmstead or ranch. So when I spied this Gator at a sale being conducted by Sullivan Auctioneers, I had to look it over, and I was surprised. This is a 2011 model that is certainly dolled up. It has both front and rear brush guards and a premium cab with a zip-up poly door. Best yet, and now get this, it only has 190 hours on its tack. 190 hours. Shoot, it's like brand new. A six-year-old gator showing just break-in hours. So I'm going to be fascinated to see what this brings at today's sale. Who knows? I might even be interested in bidding on it. Now this Gator doesn't sell for a couple of hours, which gives me time to go talk to Dan Sullivan of Sullivan Auctioneers about the marketplace for used UTVs. Dan, we were looking at that 625i Gator. Now that thing just has 190 hours on it. That's got to be drawing a lot of interest at today's sale. Oh, absolutely, Dave. Anything with low hours always generates a lot of interest. Low miles, low hours, and uh, typically everybody wants something uh, that has low time on it. Now, it had a big brother who was far more popular than 825i. 
would that that's going to probably affect the value one a little bit? Oh yes, absolutely. It won't bring what an eight twenty five I will bring, but uh, you're also buying it at a, at a reduced price, so you're going to have you know a lot of people that uh, maybe that can't afford uh, one of those bigger ones that'll be bidding on this one here in a little bit. Now, if you had a hazard a guess, one hundred ninety hours, it's like brand new. What do you think that might bring? You know, doing our due diligence and doing our research where we feel that the value of that we're going our estimate's going to be somewhere around seventy five hundred dollars. We'll see how close we. Are. Well, Dan, thanks for the information. Let's go watch the 625i Gator sell. 5,000, 5,500. I'm gonna do it now, 6,000. I'm gonna do it now, 6,000. I'm gonna do it now, 6,500. I'm gonna do it now, 6,500. I'm gonna do it now, 7,500. 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 So the final price on our low hour 625i was $82.50. How does that compare to recent sales of 2011 model year Gators like this? I hit the internet looking both for auction and dealer asking prices. Let's start with those auction prices. I uncovered six 2011 Gators with hours ranging from 400 up to 600 hours. Remember, our little Gator here just had 190 hours on it. I looked for vehicles that were equipped like this one with that premium cab and the brush guards both in the front and rear. Their final bids ranged from $6,900 up to $7,100. And what about those dealer asking prices? I went to Deer's website, machinefinder.com. There I discovered 22 vehicles like this on dealer's lots. I narrowed the search to only looking for the lowest hour gators. Those asking prices ranged from $7,000 up to just short of $11,000. So considering the vehicle's condition, the person who bought this 625i actually paid above auction prices. But again, it only had 190 hours. You know, for more information about used equipment, you can read my steel deals reports in every issue of Successful Farming Magazine. And for more information about Sullivan Auctioneers, go to their website at SullivanAuctioneers.com. I'll see you again next week on another steel deals report. If you ever get near Clear Lake, Iowa come summer, make time to take in the phenomenal outdoor display of John Deere tractors put on by L and Carol Etchen. We'll give you a glimpse of that collection after these brief messages. Our Age Design Feature Tractor this week is actually a fleet of tractors, a fleet of John Deere A's that are owned by Carol and L. Etchen of Clear Lake, Iowa. And you've got to explain why you have so many A's in your collection. And that is because they all have significance for you. These were all owned by different people. So the first one in the line, that was a tractor that was run by your wife, right? L, when she yeah. was on the farm? Yeah, when she was 10 years old. And that was, it's actually marked as a GP. That was kind of one of the first years that they were our general purpose, wasn't it? Yes. So that tractor was something that was significant. Did, did that get sold by her father or did he keep it all those years? He kept it, he bought it new. Now, right next to it is a, another 19, it's a 1939 John Deere A. Whose tractor was that? That was one of my brother's tractors that he run a fertilizer plant for 30 some years. And that's what they, they had a loader on it and they had studs in the tires. So now the third tractor is a 1951 and that's kind of the most special A of all. Why is that? Because that's what I bought new and I started farming with it. Oh my gosh, was that when you were on the farm here on the location? No. That was when you were previously in another Yeah, location. that's when I was milking 50 head of cows and farming 425 acres of ground. Oh, you were a busy boy. I, yeah. Bought a tractor new, so that's pretty significant. That was kind of special for you, wasn't it? 
Yeah, that's why I kept it all these years, and I, ha I still got the plow. Oh, do you, it's a, did it run with a, what, a three-bottom plow? Three-bottom. And you farmed with it for how many years? Well, for a long time, probably. Oh, yeah, I farmed here with it. This is all I had when I come here. Now, the next A in the line is a 1952A. Whose tractor was that? That was my twin brother's. Oh, no kidding, another brother. So you had a twin brother that you were both in the service with, you told me. Yes. And that was his tractor. Now, was he farming? No, he was farming. And so that was a tractor you wanted to keep in the family. He passed away of cancer in 80, and then uh, he had a sale. And uh, my uh, one brother bought the tractor mm -hmm. and uh, bought the tractor. And then he had a B, and I bought the track B. Now, you also have a 1951A right here next to you. Whose tractor was that? Another brother that lived in <laughs> Wisconsin. How many brothers did you have? Four. You had four, so you, you're up to three A's and then your own A on the thing. So he lived in, was he farming up in Wisconsin? Yeah, he was farming in Wisconsin. No kidding. So when that came up for sale, you thought you better no, go get No, he that. brought it down. Oh, did he really? He moved down here. He, his uh, d wife owned the farm down by Belmont. Oh. So he moved down here. No kidding. Now, the other one, a 1949A. Whose tractor was that? Don't uh, tell me you had another brother. I thought you were out of brothers by now. No, we still got another brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I shelled corn for a guy over by Mason City, so he got me over a shell of corn, and then he gave me these two A John Deere's for shelling the corn. Oh, no kidding. So that was the other John Deere A, which was the 1950A, too. Yeah. So that came from a neighbor then from yeah. when you were over at Mesa City. Yep. Now, that's part of kind of a fleet of equipment you have on your collection here. And what's kind of neat about this collection is it's out by the road, or all in a kind of a platform you built by the road for people to come by and see. Uh, well, this would be a steep hillside, and this is... They cleaned the road ditch out and I made them haul all the dirt up here so I could make this. Oh my God. And then I had a landscaper come and put the wall in. And so this is something where people just stop by and take a look at your collection. Yeah, they come, they come every week. They either stop down by the road or take pictures or I motion them to come up and then they're, they, uh, I got a guest book that they can sign that they seen the tractors. There's a lot of guys that work for John Deere come up here retired to see these old, the old tractors. Well, for more information about Carol Etchen's fleet of John Deere A tractors and other Aegis Iron Feature tractors, go to agriculture.com slash TV. Please join us next week for another outstanding show. I'm tracking the sale of two pieces of John Deere Precision Ag Equipment at auction. Then we feature a great farmer invention designed to convert a straight truck into a seed tender. The Engine Answer Man, Ray Bohax, offers an invaluable repair and maintenance tip. I learn how to properly weigh a tractor so it operates at peak efficiency while minimizing compaction. See you next week right here on Successful Farming.